Hello everybody and welcome to today's episode of Shorts. This is the very last episode in the series of London Symphonietta's Lockdown Live series where London Symphonietta performers play live to you uh, from their own homes to you, the audience at home. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. It really does mean so much to have an audience here at this strange time while the planet is turning on its head and none of us know when we're going to get back to live performing again. So thank you so much. It means so much knowing that you're there listening. We've got a fab show lined up for you today. London Symphonietta's principal violinist, Jonathan Morton, is going to be playing music by Caroline Shaw and Tom Colt. And uh, both John and Tom are lurking about in the Zoom green room backstage right now. Caroline can't make it today. But uh, John and Tom are going to be uh, talking about the pieces before John then plays them. But before they do, you should know that this series has been supported by the fabulous Lark Music, uh, the insurance brokers. Huge thanks to them for keeping this wonderful series going. And um, also big thanks to the Arts Council, which underpins so much of what London Symphony are to do. Also to the sponsors, to the trusts and to the individuals who support Symphonietta. Um, thank you to all of those. Um, Symphonietta really wants to keep this series going, if it's at all possible, in the autumn to give the players a chance to perform while we still don't know what the concert hall situation is going to be. And um, so is looking for support to continue that series. Um, if any of you out there today feel that you're in a position where you might be able to contribute, however little would be hugely supported. Um, the suggested uh, donation is that of a concert ticket, a sort of Wednesday afternoon type concert, um, or anything you can manage would be hugely appreciated with great thanks. And to do that, you can go on London Symphonietta's Spangly website, www.londonsymphonietta.org.uk, where you can find out not only how to donate, but also see an amazing amount of cool stuff on there. Check out uh, Symphonietta's digital channel, masterminded by uh, London Symphonietta digital supermind, Adam Flynn, who's lurking in the wings right now. Um, and also you can uh, subscribe to this uh, London Symphonietta YouTube channel. Um, you can just see that there. And you can also, uh, have a look there to see um, a wonderful collection of live performances, masterclasses, talks, all kinds of very, very cool stuff. And finally, before I get this talky admin bit of the show out of the way, I think huge thanks should be said to the Symphonietta players themselves, who at this strange time are keeping their practice going, keeping playing, um, while my earphone drops out um, and keeping the flame burning of this live music making in uncertain times. So huge thanks for them also for grappling with the technology that we're all trying to get our heads around at this time. So um, big hello today to John and Tom. Are you there? Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, Tom. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. Hang on, I've got to put you... There we go. I can see you all now. Um, John, hello. Where are you today? I'm at home, of course. Um, yeah, I haven't, haven't made it very far, but um, yeah, I'm, um, this is my second uh, live event for Symphonietta. So yeah, it feels a little bit more familiar than the first one. Uh, and it's very nice to, to see you. And where's home for you? Where are uh, you? I'm in East Anglia, uh, Woodbridge in Suffolk. Oh, beautiful. So it must be very leafy and lush there yeah, right now. Yeah, very green. Spring has been amazing. We're actually, um, there's lots of um, baby birds at the moment sort of jumping out of nests. So we've, uh, we've attempted to rescue two lately. So basically our whole family life has been taken over by, by these kind of wonderful little birds. And um, yeah, anyway, so we, yeah, we, we've got, we're lucky to have lovely nature around us. But also, um, we were just chatting before we went on air. Um, you know, at the moment, you're in the room in the house which um, your daughter has been doing her revision in, and you've had to kick her out 
and uh, move some textbooks to the side to make yeah, room for your I, mic. Yes, I'm afraid like you, what you can't see is, you know, behind the, the camera is just piles of uh, revision papers and, uh, uh, you know, cards and stuff like that. But yeah, we had a, a little bit of a fight, but she's had this room most of the time. I'm only here for like 45 minutes. So we've, we've done a deal and hopefully she'll stick to it. Fantastic. Tom, I think you said that... Um, hello there, by the way. Hello. Sorry. We're loving this very, very tasteful green studio. It, absolutely fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Um, you said also that what we can't see is the chaos in front of you. This is... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've, there's, there's sellotape um, holding things together. It's, you know, it's... it's you, you you try and make everything behind you look all nice um but it's it's honestly sticky tape and glue on the holding it together i think we all feel like that um internally <laughs> <laughs> what i love about your website at the moment is in the upcoming news um, you're the first person i've seen who actually says none have you read the news recently <laughs> <laughs> but there's yeah. also very movingly um you've just put in all the events that have been cancelled which is of course what we're all doing right now and, yeah, it's um, a really, it was a really depressing um website update you know normally, normally you sort of um you know you try to keep the website updated with all the you know all these exciting things that's fun um and <laughs> it's the first time i've sort of just de de updated it really <laughs> There's this strange process we've all gone through of completely wiping our diaries, sort of, bit yeah, by bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's less depressing to wipe the diary, though, than to leave the events in and then sort of see them, oh, today I should be doing this. Um, so, yeah, the, I mean, I suppose the big one for you was the opera, which was going to happen at Albra Festival. Y yes. In fact, uh, yeah, today is, is the first time we, the, the parallel world, London Symphony so would it was the first time the singers and the and the band would be uh rehearsing together um yeah it's it's you know it, like so many other exciting projects of of people's that it, that's had to be put on hold and and it will happen in some form but you know there's no certainty of uh when but yeah there's yeah there's lots of people who are really behind doing it so it's still um, happening and are you managing to write while all this is going on? Um, I'm, I'm sort of slowly grinding back into gear. Like I didn't, at the, at the, at the beginning, I didn't really uh, write anything. I, I did some, a bit of teaching. I did some, um, a bit of music for children, uh, playing and, and arranging, uh, which has been really fun because my partner is uh, downstairs doing online uh, violin teaching as we speak. Um, and so I've been helping out a bit doing that. Been tending an allotment. That's been fun. There's also some cucumbers there, which are doing quite well. Um, so yeah, this, it's, it's, I've been sort of productive in uh, various ways. And then slowly I'm becoming a composer again. Well, it's completely fab that you're here today. And we're going to hear a couple of very, very beautiful pieces of yours. But first, um, we're going to start with um, a piece by Caroline Shaw. Um, John, you've played this piece before, I think. Uh, no, I've heard it. Uh, I heard it perform live, um, but I've never actually played this. This is the first time I'm, I'm playing it, but I've, yeah, I've heard it quite a few times. And uh, yeah, it's a lovely piece. Um, you know, obviously solo violin repertoire is huge. And uh, this just kind of jumped out at me for some reason. You know, it was just sort of, uh, I just thought I fancied learning it and, and playing it. In fact, you heard um, Daniel Puro, who I think, Tom, you've ri you wrote your concerto for, um, violinist, uh, violin concerto, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was Daniel Puro who introduced you to this piece, That's John, right. is that right? That's right, yeah, um, a couple of years ago, I think it was. Uh, and I just, I just remember it, you know, both for the performance and, and the piece itself. So, um, yeah, but I, I know I've, I've been in touch with Daniel and he said, how, you know, obviously he was supposed to perform Tom's concerto. I think it was round about this time too, Tom, right? Uh, yeah, he was doing it uh, last week and then he yeah. was doing it next week yeah. as well. So, yeah, I, mean, I really feel like <laughs> had all these amazing premieres happening. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I'm just going to, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can make it up by playing two little etudes of yours, but uh, I'll, do, <laughs> I'll do what I can. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, for the punters at home, um, Caroline Shaw, she's um, a New York based musician. She's a vocalist, a violinist, a uh, composer, obviously, and also a producer. And she was the youngest recipient for the Pulitzer Prize for Music in 2013 for her piece, Partita for Eight Singers, and she teaches at New York University. Um, and I think this is a very cool bit of info from her bio. She's produced for Kanye West, not yeah. something that crops up often in the new music world, let's face it. And um, according to her bio, she loves the colour yellow, otters, Beethoven Op 74, the smell of rosemary, and the sound of a janky mandolin. More biogs should have that kind of info in it. Um, so John, tell us a little bit about um, this piece about the violin writing. Um, the piece starts with a quite interesting texture. I don't want to sort of spoil the surprise, but um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how it opens and what yeah. happens. Yeah, sure. I mean, she, she based, the, the title is uh, um, a reference to a much older piece of music by Thomas Tallis. Um, and uh, I think she heard that piece in a, in a beautiful cathedral somewhere and it just kind of, so she's taken that memory, sort of echo, very echo acoustic and has transferred it. I must say it, this wasn't actually originally written for the violin, it's originally a cello piece, um, but it's been trans, uh, arranged for viola or violin. Um, so originally it was a, it was a cello piece and um, the, the very first instruction uh, is a kind of very scribbly, uh, it literally is a scribble uh, before the notes and, and uh, oh, there, there you go. Oh, you come on, webcam. Scribbles there above the first three no notes. Oh, well, let's do it. And okay. the instruction is kind of quite loose and free, which is nice. It's just basically a sort of going between pitched sounds and kind of noise, you know. Um, and I, I guess for me, my imagination, she's kind of hearing the ambient sounds in the in this very uh, huge acoustic that she heard the original Talis in, maybe. And and then gradually this pitch kind of comes and then it sort of goes away again. So uh, yeah, that's that's how it begins. But there's, um, it's very loosely based on the Talis. It's kind of, it references some of the harmony, some of the melodies that you hear in the piece that's at least 450 years old or something. But of course she completely reworks it in her own uh, way. And then there's also a couple of places where she, um, she asks the performer to hum or sing uh, specific uh, notes. So that, that's a bit of a challenge. I hope I'll, um, I'll manage to do it. I'm glad you told us about that, John, just in case people thought you were having a strange fit. It is actually your voice that is happening. That might happen as well, but you know, yes. Um, there's an interesting thing she talks, uh, the title, by the way, in um, Manus Tuas means in thy hands. And um, she says that uh, the original, the first performance was to be um, in a church at, th at the time for a, a Compline service, which is very much a... Um, the lot, it's the last um, prayerful uh, service of the day. Um, Compline meaning completion um, in Latin, referring to the end of the day's work. And I think the uh, cellist had to perform this in the nave of the church, um, candle lit. You know, we can imagine you there, John, in a very, very sort of reverent kind of place. But what's interesting about this is that she says, rather than very specifically referring to Talis's harmony all the way through, she's more referring to the moment of hearing that Talis the first time. So it's as though she's suddenly taking a little temporal chunk and then it's, it's almost more about her reaction to that feeling that she had rather than the music itself. It's, in other words, it's at a remove and that's interesting. Yeah, I think you've explained it much better th than I have. Um, but yeah, it, that's that's kind of how it feels to me when, when I play it. It's uh, she's expressing her, her her she's taking her memory as a starting point and then elaborating on that memory. And before we hear it, Tom, is that something you've ever worked with? This notion of memory—it's very Proustian kind of thing. But have you have you ever used your musical putty Madeleine in this kind <laughs> of way? There's some. Um there's weirdly there's a there's a thing that's currently brewing in my head that that is um that will become a piece um i, I mean in lockdown i've i've um been listening to a lot of uh frank sinatra and that there's specifically the sort of slow the, the slower stuff like um albums like uh, where are you and only the lonely and, stuff. and there's there's something 
like how it, it is i find it really interesting how it, it captures a nostalgia and I, I feel like it would have been even a nostalgic thing when it was new music and there's i'm going to do something with it but i'm not quite sure what or when but it, it will form something <laughs> That's fantastic. It's a very interesting concept. Yeah, nostalgia and memory. Well, John, um, I, if you're feeling ready, let's light the candles in the nave of the Suffolk Woodbridge bedroom that you're in right now. And here is In Manus To Us by Caroline Shaw.
fantastic, beautiful, beautiful performance. That was In Manus to Us by Caroline Shaw, performed by London Symphonietta's principal violinist, John Morton. Many congratulations. Um, John, it's not an easy thing to play and sing at the best of times, but having to do it live over Zoom is something else. Yeah, it's a, a bit of a first really, but um, yeah, it's strange playing you know, on your own, um, but it's, yeah, you just have to keep thinking that there are people out there, you know, watching and listening. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, the, the more we do it, the more we'll get used to it, I guess. Well, you look completely natural on the Zoom stage. Um, so the, just for the punters, they may have been surprised to see you playing that um, beautiful chorale like pizzicato section with holding the violin like a guitar. Could you just tell us why that works better? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe you can, uh, you you know you're a cellist of course uh, Zoe of, although people may not know that the the uh, people watching but um, there's something about like arpeggiated pit scores you know with several um, like three part or four part co uh, notes that I find just it's more natural somehow I, I'm sure playing them on cello is super natural and the guitar is the next best thing but on the violin it just feels I don't know I, I just it, it's I find it slightly easier to control and get um, yeah so that that that's my reason really uh, I don't really have I don't know what do you think Tom you're, you're a violinist do you know what I mean uh, yeah not not to the same degree as you are um, I, I I agree though but also I I I grew up playing guitar as well so it that that seems very natural to me I don't I would definitely hold it like you're holding it to do that bit yeah. And certainly, like to you know, um, you, you have much more control over whether you do it sort of up the right, you know, from bottom to top or top to bottom, like a guitar. Whereas when you're like this, it all feels a bit, I don't know. Um, it's, I probably haven't practiced it enough like this, and I'm slightly <laughs> cheating, but who cares? Um, I think it comes down to simple ergonomics and quality. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. it makes it, it makes a beautiful sound like that. Thank so you. from this um, meditative state of Caroline's piece. We're now going to go, uh, Tom, to three, we're going to hear two out of four etudes that you've written for the violin. Uh, tell us about how they came into being. Um, yeah, there's actually, there's, there's, a, there's a numbers five and six knocking about that, I've that I recently finished. Um, but yeah, the, the, the first ones I wrote uh, ages ago, in about um, 10 or 11 years ago, uh, for my partner, who's who's a violinist, and, and it, uh, she was playing in a recital when we were both at university, uh, and so I wrote her uh, these two little studies to play, and then um, then I in when when was it 2014? I wrote two more for John um, for the London Symphony Theatre, um, and I thought, oh, I'll you know, oh, a solo violin, I might as well add to those little things, and then. I've just written these others. So I think like every sort of five years or so, I'll keep adding a little pair and see what happens. Um, they're quite fun because I, I, don't, I don't normally pick up my violin very often, but um, you know, it's, it's, I, I enjoy getting out to write these things. And, and sometimes it's, uh, you know, I write them like I would anything else and, and sort of play around with pitches and rhythms and try and make my melodies as, I normally would, but like for some of them, I tried to sort of probe something about the about how the violin sort of physically works. So the, the second one that you'll hear, which is number four, um, is sort of based around a specific thing that the, that the violinist has to do, um, which is to play two strings together that aren't next to each other, um, and then to play three strings at once which normally you, you, you are told you can't do, you can't play three notes at once, or you can play them very quickly and very loudly, a very short notes, and you'll get three at once, but not sustained. But I've, I found a sort of a way to do it, basically. So I, there's, there's sort of three note chords going on. And that's the kind of thing that I wouldn't have been able to do without, you know, trying it out. This really exciting. I think what we should do is get John to demo that before we hear that one. 
um, because that is quite an extraordinary uh, kind of technique to hear. But first, let's... Tuning, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's, uh, there's going to be a, a total retuning of strings for that for this uh, for the second one that you're going to hear. But John, um, tell us about this piece. Um, you've played this before, right? Yes, uh, yeah, I performed uh, both of them uh, a few times. Uh, I can't remember exactly when, but I think around the time that, that Tom wrote, especially the fourth one, right, Tom? I think that was the, the new one. You premiered both of them. Yeah. Oh, did I premiere number three as well? <laughs> yeah, oh, you did. I forgot, I'd forgotten, sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, it's really nice to come back to them, I have to say. Uh, they've kind of stayed um, in, in the back of my mind. It's, um, you know, so it's, it's like seeing an old friend again. It's, it's lovely. Um, the f yeah, so the, the, the first one that I'm going to play is kind of very, very active um, and uh, very unpredictable kind of energy uh, outburst. Every note is like a sort of outburst of energy and you don't quite know when it's going to come. And then, so there are two sort of main ideas. You hear that those kind of uh, quite explosive um, uh, notes and then there's a kind of running, running notes, uh, patterns that start to sort of interrupt and that sort of gradually take over. Um, Tom, is there anything you want to say about, probably you can say it in more eloquent no, that's, than myself? That's exactly right, yeah, there's this sort of punchy, it's kind of a groove really that, that goes along, but then as you say, it gets it starts getting infected like sort of not weed with, with this sort of, um, these, these faster notes and sort of scales that go up. Um, and yeah, they get long, these chains get longer and longer and longer. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the game. I love this idea of music being infected by semiquavers, which is literally, yeah. <laughs> I think, what you put in your program note. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, and also, um, there's quite a strict schema for the way that you've written this, haven't you? So, so just in terms of the pitches, you've got a set of 10 notes, is that right? Working as a sort yeah, of row? I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's various things going on under the hood uh, that are, you know, they're, they're sort of... of I find them. I find them useful, which is the most important thing. I, I also find them of interest, which is a secondary benefit. Um, uh, but yeah, there's there's sort of rhythmic games and 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 pitch games going on. But really, the 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 goal was this kind of punchy groove thing and this um, infestation. Really, is that is the sort of uh, yeah what what this this attitude does really. Fantastic. Well, it's nice to hear that you're not penned in by your processes. So I think we should hear it. So why don't we, yeah, we'll split these two up to give John a chance to detune in the middle. So here we go. This is Etude number three uh, by Tom Colt. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. That was uh, Etude number three by Tom Colt, and this is John Morton performing live from Woodbridge in Suffolk. Um, you've been practicing, John. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've, I've had to, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's good to do these things because, um, like you said, we, need, we all need to kind of keep, keep working somehow. Um, and this is, you know, it's the best kind of thing to just focus uh, on something and, and prepare it uh, and perform it. So, yeah, I'm glad to have had that opportunity. I know that you need to detune for the for the next uh, uh, piece that we're going to do, but um, just wanted to ask you, does this feel like virtuoso writing? It certainly has that bravura kind of energy to it. Yeah, the one I just played. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it has exactly that sort of heroic uh, violinist um, bravura type writing. And actually, number four, the, the one that I'm about to play, um, is completely almost the opposite. It's, um, uh, but paradoxically, I find it much, much harder to play. <laughs> uh, because uh, as Tom mentioned before, um, he he basically explore, explores this rather niche technique. I mean, it's so niche, I, 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 I've never come across it before. Um, and uh, it's just wonderful when, when somebody kind of finds something new to do with, a, with an instrument. You know, uh, many people have had a go at, at playing with these, these simple uh, devices. But I think, um, I think, Tom, this, well, I've, I've ne certainly never come across this specific kind of technique. And it's, it's bloody hard. But it's, yeah. when it works, it's rather nice. Um, it's so, it's basically so the the margin for error is almost you know zero, and it's it's a very fragile kind of zone where you can hit three strings and they all speak together, um, and just you know like a, a tiny little um, movement of the bow in the wrong direction, you ju you just lose one or the one doesn't speak or you know so. But, but the effect, if it works, is rather, it's like a sort of meditation, uh, like, a, like a sonic meditation. Um, and the detuning of the violin really helps um, to, to achieve that. So I'm tuning my lower string down to an F and the top uh, E string to a, an E flat. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna, maybe, maybe Tom, you can say a few things whilst I, uh, make some noise detuning <laughs> yeah i mean as as john said it, it's it this 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 technique is hard and it, it's um and it's yeah it's not hard in in that flying around the instrument way it's it um it requires this kind of zen like um state i think and um and because the it, it's because it's not sort of reliable um it's it's almost um there's a real fragility to to the sound first of all and then also the the process of watching someone which you, i think you get more when you're in the room with them but um the the process of watching someone is like they're doing something incredibly fragile and delicate and careful um and i think it it should do slightly it's a sort of psychological a psychodrama to watch someone do this this um very fragile technique um yeah like they're like they're sort of um i don't know doing keyhole surgery or, or, or repair you know manipulating something incredibly small in front of your eyes that's sort of the idea so the sheer effort of will just to make this fragile thing work is uh, a performance all in itself and uh, allows us the audience to enter into a similar kind of mindset let's see if we can do it now here we go so here is etude number four uh by tom Cold, and here is john morton do you want play. me to demonstrate any of it zoe or should we just i think what we should do is hear it, the whole piece and Great. then we can show the mechanics afterwards what do you think yeah that's fine good, I'll, good I'll, plan i'll do my best yeah
Wow, thank you so, so much. What an incredible performance. Um, that is a level of virtuosity that I think few people can attain. That is a ferociously difficult thing to do and hauntingly beautiful. Many congratulations. Well, thanks, Zoe. I'm, um, I'm, I, my main concern was that you could hear it because it's pretty soft and uh, I don't know how the mic picked it up, but hopefully it's something. Came Great. Up. We could hear it. It really should also, it, even even if you're in the room with it as well, it should make people lean yeah. lean in slightly. Yeah, yeah. That was that was fantastic. Thanks so much, Sean. I mean, uncannily, uh, all I mean, every single note of those three note chords was there the whole time. Um, I think now that we've heard it, I, I have a feeling that well, we'll chat a bit. I think we should hear that again before the show ends because it's such an incredible thing. Um, but John, I wonder if you could just now show us the mechanics of how that technique works. So this is the three chord. Those, those at home, by the way, if, if you're just tuning in, this is a technique which is involving sustained three note chords, which is something that as far as, well, none of us seem to know that that's been done anywhere else before. I certainly haven't come across it. So John. Um, gosh, I'm, uh, you're putting me on the spot to explain this in a way that- Well, maybe makes, you makes could just- long, But maybe I can, maybe I'll, I'll try it. So um, normally, maybe I'll come closer. Uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, on, a, on a normal violin, you can only play strings that are adjacent to each other. So you can play those two strings together, or those two strings together, or those two strings together. Um, but Tom asks uh, me to play sometimes these two strings, which has one string in the middle, and also a lot of the time these three strings at the same time. And the reason why it's not possible to do that normally is because of the curve of the bridge. Um, but by using the left hand to alter the height of the string, uh, and this is a question of sort of millimeters or, or even smaller <laughs> uh, units than, than millimeters, uh, by changing the, the height of the middle string, um, there's a point where the bow will touch all three strings. But the point is very, very specific uh, between the bridge and the, and, and the left hand. So you've got absolutely no margin. Um, for error. Sorry, I don't know if you could see that, or if that even barely explains it. Tom, is, is that is that it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, you know, the, the, in, on a on a yeah on a violin or a cello or anything, that the, the strings are curved, which is really useful because that means you can bow only one at once and you won't get confused. Whereas a guitar is they're all flat, um, and a mandolin they're all they're all flat because you want to hit as many as possible at the same time. Um, but yeah, it's. It's, it, it's just a case of bending one of the strings down so your finger your finger goes there um but then at either point along here there'll be a point where it's at the same height as its neighbors um it like you're creating like a, a guitar bridge somewhere on the fingerboard essentially yeah but only in one specific place as you say because it yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, the physics of it, by detuning the strings down so that they're slightly slacker, does that help this process or is that just incidental? Um, no, it doesn't help that process. I've done it with, with um, you know, normally, normally tuned instruments. Um, in fact, if anything, it probably makes it slightly tougher. Um, but no, but the, 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 the low F is, is really to... It's, all, it's slightly to make the instrument a bit strange. So like the, as, as well as the, the sort of visual strangeness of seeing three note chords in, you know, semi briefs and so on, on, on the music, it, it slightly makes the instrument in the hands a, a, a strange one and maybe a strange one for the composer when, when you're writing for it. Um, I mean, I, 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 for, I have tuned more often, I've tuned, tuned quite a lot of string instruments uh, in various ways, but but most often I, I reduce all the strings by the same amount. So if I, I'll have in orchestra pieces and string quartets and things, I've, I've had like a, uh, a violin where all the strings are tuned down a semitone or all the strings are tuned down a tone, so, um, which means the relationship is similar and the, the sort of pattern of the fingering is different, but the sound that comes out is, is, um, is different. Uh, but this just literally gives you an extra bit at the bottom and then a kind of this strange E flat at the top. There are also not very many notes in this piece, so it's nice to have some of, like, and a lot of them are F. So, it, you know, it, 
it makes sense to have that low thing that supports the whole thing. I was lucky enough to um, read a few words of your beautifully written PhD uh, writings on, on this piece. And you mentioned um, that composers Ligeti and Sukchin, um, Lackenman, Luke Bedford, there's a whole load who've, who've written solo pieces for violin or cello, which are exploring the very nature of the instrument itself. So rather than imposing a load of extended techniques on another structure, it's actually about exploring the open string itself, what it can do. Yeah, and, but the, and the instrument, uh, there's, there's the, the sort of Unsukchin and, and Ligeti and Luke Bedford, they, they, they start their concertos for, for string instruments with, with open strings, and Berg obviously does, and um, it's, it's a nice starting point when you are thinking, what do I do with this wooden object? You, you sort of think about the facts of it. Like what are the main facts of it? Oh, it has these, it has four strings and it has, and they are these pictures and so on. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, Lackerman obviously had, for, in so many pieces, uh, looks, he, he just finds ways of, of, of seeing these objects in, in new lights and, and, and just, you know, working from first principles, like his his cello piece Pression, obviously is is, is um, for those that don't know it, it's 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 an extraordinary examination of this wooden object, this wooden box, resonant box with a fingerboard and some strings, um, because it it's it's kind of that rather than a cello piece, because it 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 doesn't feel like the cello repertoire it's it's just a completely new examination of this box uh, i would never in a million years claim that my mine is anything like that but there's there's some some of the same like trying to work out what to do but from an angle coincidentally uh caroline's piece that we heard before this also starts off in a not dissimilar kind of way john isn't that right you're kind of bringing sound out of out yeah, of it's also open strings, like um, Tom mentioned, you know, it starts with open string. And I think, um, you know, as a kind of traditional instrument, the vi you have to kind of start with the open strings and the, the harm harmonics, you know, that's kind of the natural resonance of the instrument. And I guess, you know, um, it's okay to, to, get, to go very far from that, but it's also very important to remember that that sort of underpins it. I, I like what you said about first principles, um, Tom. I think it's, it's really important that I find when you you know learn an instrument like this because it's so technically difficult you, you can spend many many months and years going down these uh you know technical and, and exploratory uh paths but you forget the kind of first principles it's, it's quite easy to forget these really basic things and that's what i loved about this study you know it was like oh yeah uh, sorry i say study it's etude of course uh, in french means study and it, it's it's the right word i think for this piece you it's like a study of what's pos what it's possible to do with with these strings and and fingerboards and and resonance boxes um and yeah and i had to really like study my instrument again and sort of find out how how to make those those sounds that that tom has written and i think that's a, it's a wonderful thing to to be able to to be given that that opportunity to to keep finding new new sounds and new uh, new things to do with this very kind of simple setup that word study is quite loaded um, for us as players, uh, Tom. Had you, had you thought of it as being an exploration of specific techniques, that word etude, or something, or something else? Well, it kind of, it sort of means a different thing, but a, a sort of Venn diagrammed different thing for composers. I mean, it's, for, for players, it, um, they're, they more often think of a book of studies where it goes number one, number two, number three, and there might be four, uh, you know, 24, one in each key, it's to do with scales and arpeggios and, and things, and it's a bit more um, uh, methodical. Uh, whereas I guess the, the, the etude tradition for composers, um, you know, is, comes from kind of Chopin and, and Debussy and, and so on, where, where the, it's, it's sort of you 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 put your imagination, but it's a very it, it's a very defined bit of music that does a certain thing for a while, and then you do another one that does something else for a while. But the point is is 
making having a, an incredibly defined type of music for each one. So that so number three is incredibly different to number four. Um, numbers one, two, and now five and six are completely different again. And that it's sort of a little. I like writing them because they're it's it, it's just a little test that you you know try and do something as um that's as much itself as possible as you possibly can and then you don't even have to do it for that long and then you can move on beautifully put well i think it feels that uh, we should hear this piece one more time to end the show um i just wanted to say that the three string technique i was suddenly reminded of um francis marie wheaty uh cellist um, who developed a two bow technique so she could play um, uh, four, four notes at once. I'm doing that because it's like knitting needles. Uh, I once asked her to show me how she did it and it's a very closely guarded secret. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, strictly speaking, strictly speaking um, we shouldn't have explained how my technique is done because <laughs> I, in fact, I, I, I got told once, I, I went for a drink with a, a, another composer who teaches um, composition and and they said I, I they said right i've got a bone to pick with you i had a student who'd somehow got hold of your score and had misunderstood the technique and brought brought me a violin violin music full of three note chords that would never never work <laughs> oh no so after this show we're going to expect a tsunami of three chord violin music beware yep. john what we've brought on you so uh while the sun is blazing forward from my window, I can see the sea out there, aren't I lucky? Um, we're now, I know. <laughs> um, I think it would be a lovely thing to hear this Etude Number no. 4 by Tom Colt with John Morton playing.
the magical haunting sounds of etude number four by Tom Court, played there by John Morton, bringing us to the end of today's episode of Shorts and indeed to the end of this current series of Shorts. A huge, huge thank you to Jonathan Morton, St London Symphony Editor's Principal Violinist, and to Tom Court for being with us today, and to you, the audience at home, without whom none of this would make any sense. Thank you so much, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you again in the autumn. Bye.